Good afternoon and uh, welcome once again to our webinar and we have now reached uh, the second segment and we will change our focus to Turkey and as stated before please start typing the questions as soon as the presentation starts. There is a slight delay from when you type your questions till I can read them on the screen so please start typing. Also uh, thank you for being active with questions as before. Hopefully that will continue after this presentation. And now it's my great pleasure to leave the floor for you Sven, Danish ambassador to Turkey. Uh, unmute please. We can't hear anything. I tried to reconnect. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Great. Absolutely. Very Can clear. Start. I don't know what was wrong. I was saying thank you. Uh, good to see you, Jens and, uh, and Ivan, and thank you uh, for uh, this great initiative. Uh, we love at the embassies to be able to talk not only to our friends at DI, but also, of course, to the companies uh, that are interested in, uh, in the markets where we are living in and working. And especially thank you also for playing Turkish music uh, in the intermission. That was much appreciated down here in, in Ankara. My idea was to uh, talk uh, briefly about the corona situation, give you an update on that, what's happening on that in, in Turkey. That will move us quickly into uh, what that means for the economic situation in, uh, in Turkey. And then I would like to, towards the end, to give a few pointers of what I think we should watch for, uh, for in the, the third, fourth quarter, uh, as we see how Turkey is able to handle the uh, situation, what would be particularly uh, relevant factors to look out for uh, when we are judging the Turkish market. Now, first of all, on the corona situation, um, when we talk to our Turkish friends about this or that issue in this wonderful but troubled country uh, on migration, on economy and other things, they will often look at us and they will say, yes, yes, but don't you think we are pre doing pretty well uh, considering the neighborhood we're in? Turkey is a country bordering Syria, Iraq, Iran, Greece, uh, even Russia. Uh, so it is a, a troubled uh, neighborhood, and this is the same story when we talk about corona. Corona is a big issue for Turkey. They're suffering at the moment. I'll give you some numbers. Uh, but when you consider the fact that uh, Turkey is bordering southern Europe and bordering Iran and countries with very, very weak health sectors, namely Iraq and, and Syria at the, at the moment, you could also argue that they're doing pretty well for the situation. Now, uh, you should add to that also that uh, Turkey is struggling with uh, uh, no, no less than 4 million uh, uh, refugees and, and migrants in the country, uh, which also makes the situation even more difficult to, to deal with. What happened in Turkey was that they were surprisingly hit later uh, than many uh, neighboring countries, uh, later than Europe and later than Iran. Only on the 10th of March did they register the first corona case in Turkey. So they were hit hard but late. After that, however, we saw some of the fastest rise in the world uh, in the number of new cases coming in to Turkey. And currently, Turkey is the eighth uh, in the world with 127,000 confirmed corona cases. It places it just after Russia in seventh place. Next is Turkey with 127,000. 3,400 deaths is the current number. So it's serious and it's, it's big. They are earlier in the curve also than many European countries, including Denmark. The timing is very bad for Turkey. Turkey was just coming out of recession in 2019. They have been since 2016, when the economy has been in dire straits, they have been turning all handles to keep the economy afloat. Uh, they've been using liquidity, all sorts of instruments, 
uh, to avoid that the voters who in the number of elections they had to since 2016 would feel the worst of the consequences. They've been giving tax breaks, cutting, cutting interest rates, reducing reserve requirements. They've even been raiding the state accounts uh, with central banks and other places, using the assets, whatever they had, to uh, up the situation. Um, but since they have been tough on, on this, uh, they, uh, they, they, they were also early in imposing measures. And there's been basically two waves. The first one was just a few days after the first uh, uh, corona case was registered. And the second wave was at the beginning of the Ramadan two weeks ago. Many of the things are like what we've seen in Denmark and in other countries. They have been closing schools, universities, shopping malls, restaurants. But they've also been using uh, curfews and so forth. Uh, for instance, um, uh, all weekends uh, and all holidays are now curfews in, in 31 uh, uh, provinces so that nobody is allowed to leave uh, except for emergencies uh, uh, the, uh, their houses. For a long time, every person under 20 and over 65 have been banned from leaving their homes at any time. There's complete ban on intercity travel uh, between 31 provinces, uh, you need a special permit for that, and all internal flights, trains and buses have been closed down. But if you look carefully at this, you can also see that because of the dire economic situation that Turkey is in, this has been targeted to keep the production sector alive as far as possible. It is in the weekends, it is those outside the productive ages, below 20 and above 65, that are the hardest hit on this. And this is, of course, because Turkey finds itself in a dilemma, like we know, at home. Do you fight corona? Do you reopen the economy? But even worse here, because they're just coming out of recessions and all tools have been used. But with the tools they implemented so far, they have been successful in bending the curve. Compared to just one week ago now, we're down to 64 daily deaths was the figure uh, yesterday, and that's having the number in just uh, just a week. They're aided in this by, of course, being coming later to the party and therefore being able to prepare a little longer than some European countries. They're aided by a relatively young population uh, that is more robust to uh, the disease. And they're aided by the luck that over the past decade, Turkey has invested large sums in the health sector, so they have uh, a decent and relatively strong healthcare sector that can deal with the issue. So already, Turkey is now in a situation where they start discussing a, an easing of some of the, the sanctions. Um, you might say that's, that's a little early when they came in as late as 10th of March, but actually if you look at the figures, uh, they're pretty comparable to what we know in Denmark. Per capita number of cases is higher than in Denmark, which is worrying since they're earlier in the curve, but number of deaths is actually lower than what we know in Denmark. So what are they talk, talking about? The president uh, is talking about easing some of this, uh, the sanctions uh, by the end of the Ramadan. That's towards the end of May. Um, he even talks about a double Bayram, a double Eid celebration, celebrating not just the end of the Ramadan, but also easing of uh, some of the restrictions. Um, the uh, different age groups, the the children up to uh, 14, the 15 to 20 year olds, and the plus 65s have all been designated now a certain day uh, and a number of hours where they're allowed to leave their homes. And uh, this will happen next week. They're looking forward to that. Malls and hairdressers and so forth will open on May uh, 11th. And there are expectations, though no confirmations yet, but expectations that international flights might reopen at the end of the Ramadan. Uh, including also internal flights, but we need still to see the, the decision on that. So they've tried their level best to, to design these measures so that they, uh, they safeguard the economy. Now the economy. That looks very difficult, like in most countries, it is tre it's a tremendous blow right after a recession. Uh, just one figure from one month to the other, the PMI index uh, dropped from 48.1 to 33.4, which is uh, an abyss, you know, looking into this. And this is even only, as we know, in the manufacturing sector, where the service sector is even harder hit. The government in the beginning, in typical uh, Turkish optimism, said we don't expect the corona to mean any changes in our uh, growth assessments for 2020. Uh, they will have to revise that. Uh, IMF revised its growth forecast 
sharply down to minus 5% in 2020, recovering with plus 5% in 2021. IMF is expecting 17% unemployment and 12% inflation at the end of the year. Turkey has, of course, kicked in with stimulus packages. A massive 200 billion lira, that's the equivalent of about 200 billion Danish kroner, um, has been put forward. But when you, that's a big amount. But when you compare to many European nations, certainly including uh, Denmark and Germany, uh, it is actually very moderate. 200 uh, billion lira is about half of what Denmark is spending on, uh, on stimulus packages and trying to keep the economy afloat or the equivalent of about 4% of the Turkish uh, GDP, or in terms of m lira or krona per capita, about 1 30th of the amount that the Danish government is spending. The reason is, of course, not that they don't see the need, but that they are severely restrained by what they can do in terms of stimulus. Some of the things they have been doing is the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Turkey, which is small, but is able to take over insolvent companies when needed. Layoffs are not allowed for private companies for three months. However, they are allowed to send them home without pay. And there's been a series of postponements of, of, uh, of tax payments and so forth, targeting is particularly the SMEs and some social measures also. But the fact remains that particularly the tourism sector is going to be very, very hard hit. Two million people and 5% of GDP is directly from the tourism sector much higher if we take the indirect effect from those delivering to the uh, tourism sector. 52 million tourists were here last year. We wonder how many will come this year. The government is talking about establishing COVID-free uh, zones. We wonder how that's going to pull off. We've seen a reaction in the Turkish lira. It has been dropping to um, more than seven lira per dollar. And for those of you who follow it with the Danish krona, we're now below one Danish krona for one uh, lira at 97 euro. The weak point, though, comes from this currency weakness. The Achilles heel for the Turkish economy is uh, the, uh, the foreign debt. Not like in Italy, uh, the state's debt, foreign debt, but rather, uh, because that's in good shape, but rather the private sector debt. A large segment of SMEs and medium-sized companies in Turkey have foreign currency debt. With the plummeting sales and plummeting, um, plummeting lira, it's going to be very hard for them to service that uh, debt. That is the big fear. That is the, uh, the titanic issue of the Turkish economy. Will we see uh, an avalanche of bankruptcies amongst the SMEs because they simply cannot service their their debt. So Turkey needs foreign capital. Reserves are low. They've spent it on uh, defending uh, the lira, running out of money. Foreign direct investments have come to a halt. And the president has said, we will not be going to the IMF for assistance. Uh, so Turkey is in dire need of capital. Let me then talk about some of the specifics that the Danish companies are saying that they are encountering during these difficult economic times. One thing is the border issue. Um, can we move goods across the border? Uh, there's been for a long time a 14-day quarantine requirement for any truck drivers coming to the Turkish border, um, which makes it impossible for many companies to get their goods in. Um, that has been lifted last week, so that now truck drivers also from Denmark and from other European countries can deliver their goods uh, as long as they get out again of the country within 72 hours. The Consulate General in Istanbul is following this on a daily basis and sending reports home, so if you need updates on this, we're absolutely available to give it to you on a daily basement. A second big issue is that there's simply no cash left in this country. So liquidity is something that's putting a big strain on, uh, on companies here. And uh, of course, the exporters are feeling this directly. Probably worst in the uh, health sector, where now government payments and hospital payments are delayed by about one year, even including, according to our reports, things that are needed uh, for COVID-19 uh, preparedness and uh, treatment. In the service sector, we've seen a near collapse in, in some subsectors, so like tourism or facility management, cleaning services and so forth, with massive uh, uh, amount of people uh, being sent uh, home. The good news is that in, in the industrial sector, uh, sub-suppliers, uh, there's still demand there. The Danish companies we're talking to are saying there's still demand, 
there's some positive numbers for the latest uh, turnover date, but the outlook, uh, of course, they're expecting somewhat of a slump as we go into the uh, the uh, end of the second quarter and the, the third quarter, but not as bad as we could have uh, thought, also because they're able to keep up uh, production because of the way the curfew has been handled in Turkey. Now, a little bit about the outlook, what to look for. I'll talk about politically, economically, and then opportunities there might be. Politically, uh, I think one to watch for is that Erdogan's popularity, he's been at the helm for more than 17 years now. And his popularity is not, is not least due to an economic miracle where the ordinary Turk saw his income double or triple. Um, that's the basis of his popularity. That is seriously threatened now. We are such, we're looking at a possible economic crisis in such dimensions that you could see uh, political seismic shifts and social unrest. What would that mean to the political composition of this country? Secondly, watch out for American sanctions. For now, the S-400 issues, Turkey has bought Russian missiles, the Americans are angry, threatening sanctions. That's been on a hold, put on a hold now. Uh, but bank sanctions and other sanctions can be coming from the United States. We've seen earlier how that can pull the carpet under the Turkish uh, economy, particularly under the Turkish lira. The third thing is, of course, politically, the relations with Europe. Um, Turkey earlier uh, this year sent 20,000 migrants to the border to get illegally into Greece. They were not successful, but that has strained relations. Fortunately, there's a little bit of a corona lull on this now, and Mr. Borrell and Mr. Cavusoglu, the Turkish foreign minister, are talking on finding a solution. That at least is progress. So that's politically. Economically, big thing to look for is will Turkey be able to get the foreign capital that it needs? Looks like the hot money days are, are over. Will it be able to reach the necessary swap deals uh, with other central banks? The friends, friends are few. They're talking to some European countries, to Qatar, to uh, the United States about this. So far, the president is saying, IMF, over my dead body. Those are blood suckers. So let's see if, if that's happened or that's what's really needed. Second thing, economically, to look for that is uh, the weakness of the, of the Turkish lira. The central bank has run out of reserves to throw at the lira. We risk a slump in demand combined with inflationary pressure from a weak uh, lira. That is a death toll for the currency rates. So that's one uh, for, to watch for. The downside looks pretty dim. But finally, to press on with a little bit of a positive news, there are also opportunities in, in Turkey. This is wildly exaggerated by the Turkish government, but it's still uh, real. One is we talk about a localization trend uh, for manufacturing, uh, and sort of reversing the globalization a little bit. If that happens, for European companies, Turkey would offer itself as a very attractive place, uh, could be a winner in the weak term, building on a weak lira, uh, so cheap assets uh, available, skilled labor, and being within the customs union with the European uh, Union, and of course, geographical proximity. Second thing to look for is Turkey is, is winning, unlike uh, Saudi Arabia that we've just heard of, is winning from weak oil prices, Turkey is an oil importing nation, so that eases some of the pressure on the balance of payments and also, for a while at least, eases inflationary pressure. And finally, uh, what could be an opportunity for Turkey is that it's an early, looks like to be a country that's early out from the corona crisis, could be early out from the corona crisis, which could put it in a comparatively advantageous situation in the region. Uh, so in the, in the Middle East, being able to move faster in, in, in other markets. That's what I wanted to say at this point. Sorry for talking so fast, but we're running out of, the, out of time. Just uh, an invitation, uh, though, that if you want to talk about this, of course, the Consulate General in Istanbul and the embassy is, is ready to talk to you. We will be hosting ourselves uh, at the Consulate General in two weeks, uh, another webinar talking about the state of the uh, Turkish economy. And who knows, things might be uh, very different two weeks from now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sven, for this uh, very comprehensive overview. And uh, to the participants, uh, we have recorded this webinar, so you will all be able to rewatch it in case you, uh, you missed something during the presentation. Sven, so, um, you touched upon uh, yeah, how the, the Turkish economy is expected to develop, both on short term and longer term. Did you mention D uh, GDP growth also uh, for the rest of this year and next year? Yes, of course, the, uh, the embassy doesn't have its own uh, projections on that. Uh, there are some uh, 
to my opinion, very optimistic things coming out from domestic banks and banks affiliated with domestic banks. So very careful, please, in which institutes and banks you listen to, because there is severe economic pressure, uh, so political pressure on economists not to be too neg negative. I would look primarily at the IMF. The IMF tends to be perhaps on the slightly optimistic t side internationally. They are predicting the IMF a, a uh, uh, minus 5% in GDP in 2020, plus 5% in 2021. Most economists agree that in the medium to long term, uh, for demographic reasons and, and others, Turkey uh, looks to be uh, uh, one of the places in the world where we will see continued strong growth. Thank you. Then we have been asked about uh, the opportunities for, for gaining support from Denmark or EKF for through financing projects in the country. Do you know if that's possible to engage with EKF? For the that, is pos that is possible uh, to engage with the EKF. The EKF is a little bit in a in a, uh, uh, it's been over successful. Uh, the problem for the EKF in a while was that uh, that the window on, on Turkey was overfilled. It was the second largest exposure for EKF for a while. And then of course, because of the financial situation, they were very careful for, for a while, but did uh, reopen. Now, of course, we might see some cautious uh, approach from the EKF again, uh, because of the, the current situation. But the situation that's probably being referred to was uh, uh, one and a half year ago, when the EKF uh, announced uh, that they were closing new deals on Turkey, that has been reversed since. Thank you. Then there's a participant uh, asking about the travel restrictions uh, for service people working in the maritime business. Are there any, is that regarded as uh, critical services or are there any exemptions for? I have That's not heard of any outright exemptions, but of course the difference is, uh, do people uh, need to board uh, to leave uh, the ships and enter Turkish territory? Um, uh, but it would be one to watch because it was only last week that the exemptions for truck drivers uh, was uh, put in. So it's definitely one to watch for whether we will see something of the same for, for uh, maritime uh, workers. Um, but I'll have to say I don't know the, uh, the latest news on that. Thank you. And then the, the million dollar question, uh, the general reopening for business travels. Can we say anything about that? There's a lot of speculation. Uh, yesterday, the president said that he deferred the decision on that. So we are waiting uh, to see that. There's speculation saying that it would be logical for this to happen, uh, the reopening of international flights uh, and being able to do business trips to Turkey without a quarantine uh, requirement for 14 days. Uh, the, the logical expectation would be for that to happen after the uh, after the Eid, after the Ram Ramadan, uh, which would be end May. For now, uh, Turkish Airlines has started to sell, uh, an expectation for this, has started to sell tickets in and out of Turkey from May 28th, and Pegasus Airlines has started to sell tickets in and out of Turkey starting June 1st. There's a risk that uh, this will be postponed again. Uh, but so far, the president said yesterday, uh, uh, let's see, and, and until now, no decision. Thank you. That was the final question so far. Ivan, do you have one additional question? Yes, maybe just one. Uh, maybe you can just elaborate on our planned uh, energy delegation in September. Uh, of course, everything, a lot of things needs to change. Uh, we need to be able to travel uh, and we need to be able to get around. But we are planning an a energy delegation in September from 14th to, uh, to 18th of uh, September. Um, but maybe some of the ideas around it, was because in case we have it postponed, we can still uh, make some uh, noise about the, the, con uh, the content of it. Once we get to uh, September, my expectation is definitely uh, that we will be able to do business delegations once we reach uh, September. There's a degree of uncertainty around this, like there is in every country in the world. The governments are watching and deciding the last moment how they can lift restrictions. My expectations would be that that would be possible, either because there's been a general lifting of restrictions or because specifically to keep the economy afloat, business delegations are uh, allowed. So let's see, but I would be optimistic. Inshallah. Thanks a lot, Sven. It's really appreciated. And we succeeded to finish right, right on time. Uh, and to the participants, we will move on with the third part of this seminar, and that will be the Danish ambassador to Iran, Daniel Nan, and he's here physically. 
So we will bid him welcome in the room in a few seconds and then we'll move on five minutes past three. Thank you.